and we opened up Perception in 2001. Uh, we signed the papers in Danny's Kitchen. When we're designing uh, Tony Stark's technology, it's very different than when we're designing Nick Fury's technology. What are they using this uh, interactive mirror for? What are they, I don't know, using this, uh, this hologram for? We try to make it look as cool as possible as if Tony Stark was designing it. Where do you look for inspiration? Marvel had a, uh, had a Bible that they were working on, a production Bible for Wakanda. It was like 500 plus pages. We had Easter eggs, right? You know, we did Iron Man 2. It was probably three, four weeks. I didn't come home. And I, we didn't even have a shower at the studio. So you didn't even want to know what, <laughs> what I smelled like. Hey guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we have an unusual uh, couple of guests. Um, it's uh, Danny Gonzalez and Jeremy Lasky from uh, Perception VFX. This is uh, an unusual studio. Um, they create interfaces for all kind of sci-fi movies. So they did a bunch of uh, fictional interfaces for Marvel films and they are using that experience to create data visualization technologies for the real businesses. Uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy our today's conversation. Greetings and welcome to the 80 Level Roundtable podcast. In each episode, host Kirill Tokarev invites video game industry leaders to talk about the world of game development. No topic is off limits as long as it relates to video game development. New episodes are in the works, so remember to follow us or subscribe and share with someone you know will also enjoy the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. And uh, today we have with us uh, Danny Gonzalez and Jeremy Lasky from Perception VFX. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the amazing things that they're doing. So, but before we kind of uh, go into uh, the nitty gritty, can you guys do like a little introduction, tell a little bit about yourself and uh, how did uh, Perception VFX come to be? Uh, my name is Danny Gonzalez, I'm co-founder of Perception. Um, I'll give you a little bit of my background. I, uh, I went to school for business. I thought I was going to take over my father's restaurant. Um, so that was kind of the plan for my future. Um, my senior year of college, I took a special effects class to finish with, you know, cre enough credits to graduate and fell in love with it. And from, uh, then on out, I, uh, I started to pursue a career in visual effects. Um, I had an opportunity to become a production assistant at RGA, which was a studio where I met Jeremy, but it was the one studio in Manhattan that was doing all these great visual effects for films and commercials and they were working on the greatest um uh you know they would work on the biggest and, and 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 baddest commercials like for the super bowl and just the really really interesting ones and uh that had a lot of 3d and back in the mid 90s when i was there that was pretty big deal um and um worked there as a pa for i don't know eight months or so i was assistant to bob greenberg who is uh to this day one of my uh my mentors and teacher, and um, worked my way up to uh, visual effects artist. In 2001, they uh, decided to switch gears at RGA, become more of a, a dot-com company than a studio. So they closed the studio doors. And that's when Jeremy and I started talking about opening up our own studio with all the uh, possibilities of what you can do on the desktop. And technology was growing so quickly. Um, and we opened up Perception in 2001. So I'll pause there and let Jeremy uh, tell you his background. That's mine in, sure. in a very quick nutshell. Uh, my name is Jeremy Lasky. I'm Danny's partner and the other co-founder of Perception. Uh, I went to college originally to be an architect uh, at Carnegie Mellon, um, but then soon realized that that wasn't the path for me. And I transferred into the graphic design program at CMU um, and over my years there, I was introduced to title sequence design as a, uh, as a focus, as a discipline. And this is back in the um, early to mid 90s when film title sequences weren't as well known and, um, and appreciated as they are today. Um, I had a professor in my junior year that had a, uh, a collection of some of the greatest and most iconic title sequences of all time, Saul Bass's work. Uh, from all the Hitchcock films, a lot of the James Bond title sequences. Um, and he also had a, uh, a collection of title sequences from a company in New York called R. Greenberg Associates or RGA. Um, and RGA, as Danny mentioned, 
was a legendary place uh, for film work and specifically title sequences. They really became one of the uh, the greatest uh, and most recognized companies in, in the world that did them, um, starting with the original Superman titles from 1978, which they had done uh, all the way through the mid 90s, uh, the, the film Seven, which had a really uh, groundbreaking title sequence. They just did hundreds and hundreds of titles throughout the decades. Um, so I was introduced to their work, as I said, in, in uh, my college years, and that really uh, lit a fire in me uh, as something that I wanted to pursue uh, post-graduation. Um, so I got very lucky, uh, timing was right, and I ended up getting my first job out of college at RGA in New York. Um, whole other story of how that happened, which I'll save for another day. Um, but that's where I met Danny. Uh, the two of us worked together at RGA for, uh, I was there from 95 to 2000. Uh, so a little over five years. Um, Danny was there a little before me and, and stayed on a little after me. And as he mentioned, uh, RGA changed their whole studio model, um, which was exactly the motivation and, and kind of kick that, uh, that we needed to, uh, to start our own thing. You know, we both loved RGA so much. It was a great a uh, place for us to learn and grow and honestly never really thought I would leave that place uh, when I was there and everything was going really well and I was doing film work and television work and I mean it it, does, it didn't get better than that for me um, so when they uh, when they told everyone what the plans were and going back to the late 90s and early 2000s uh, uh, your listeners should remember that that was the you know the dot-com boom everything was kind of going dot-com everything was going you know startups and pre-IPOs and everybody wanted to be an internet millionaire overnight. Um, so the, you know, the, the paradigm was really shifting in the design industry at that time. And RGA um, was right on the, you know, the crest of that wave. Um, and they were very successful at it. Unlike a lot of companies that obviously um, uh, bombed out after uh, 2000, 2001. Um, but it pushed us out the door. Um, we could have stayed on to work on websites and broadband work, um, but uh, my love was film and television, uh, animation, visual effects. Um, so Danny uh, uh, and I decided we were going to take the plunge. Um, we had also started dabbling a little bit in digital video at the time. The two of us took a couple of workshops and seminars in DV, which was another big thing back then, like digital video, you know, getting a... Uh, little mini DV tapes and being able to produce, you know, high end or so-called high end broadcast work on a budget uh, was revolutionary. You know, Final Cut Pro was uh, pretty new at the time. So for under a thousand dollars, you were able to uh, edit uh, and, and compete with uh, Avids, uh, which were many times that price. After Effects and other Adobe software uh, was really getting better and better. Um, which allowed us to do motion graphics and animation on desktop computers uh, at a fraction of the cost of what we used to use. Um, Danny was using things called Flames and Infernos at RGA, which uh, cost tens of thousands of dollars to uh, to buy or lease. However, that was uh, uh, done at the time. So things were really you know happening in the industry uh, that we were taking very close note of, um, and that kind of allowed us to recognize that there was a viable a business model here where we could um, make a much more cost effective studio uh, to do television and film work um, without having to have this insane, uh, you know, backing, uh, financial backing that large uh, and upscale studios like RGA uh, had. Um, so that led us to incorporate in the fall of 2001. Uh, we signed the papers in Danny's Kitchen. Um, it was November and this was two months right after 9-11. Uh, you know, obviously we had made our decision months and months ahead of the day we signed the papers. So, you know, once that momentum started, it never stopped. Um, uh, but it was certainly a challenging and scary time in New York, uh, in the world, uh, in the economy. Uh, but it, uh, it didn't, it didn't sway us and, uh, we moved forward. So guys, uh, thank you so much for this introduction. Uh, I think it's very inspirational for most of our readers who are in majority of cases afraid to do the plunge kind of in the unknown. Um, but my question is about the things that you're doing now. And um, I'm sure you can tell a better story about that. But I'm wondering if there is 
any any bridge like between these title sequences that you were kind of infatuated with and were to help design and the things that you're doing right now is there any connection at all like does building all the way like the texts at the beginning uh, arrive and how they capture the audience does it have to do anything with kind of architecting and creating this future of visualizations data designs and so on well i mean what it what, what they have in common uh, first and foremost is storytelling you know, everything that we do at Perception, whether it's for a film or for a technology client, is all about telling a story, creating a compelling narrative. You know, obviously, film title sequences um, do that. Uh, the best of them do it really, really well, uh, take you on a journey, whether it's at the beginning of a film uh, to set up what that film might be about. You know, we've done some opening titles uh, like Black Widow, which have to tell a backstory to lead the viewer into uh, the movie they're about to watch. Or in most cases these days, uh, our titles are at the end of a movie, um, also known as main on end title sequences. And those oftentimes will, uh, will, will function as sort of like a callback uh, to some of the best mo moments in the film, um, some of the great uh, scenes that we just watched, uh, maybe uh, uh, using some of the uh, design language and thematic uh, devices that we're playing out throughout the film, we might bring back into a title sequence at the end um, to really, you know, leave uh, leave the audience uh, with a certain feeling and a certain mood coming out of the film, whether it's an upbeat mood or, or a somber mood or a, a bittersweet mood as we did with Endgame, you know, and we had to kind of say goodbye to all of these characters. Um, so, you know, each title sequence is designed very carefully with uh, with that I idea of what's the what's the tone, what's the mood, what's the story. That we're trying to tell and then uh, i'll let danny talk about the technology work and the storytelling that goes into that sure so um a lot of what we do in the films <clears throat> attracts all these technology or i should say engineers or people that that work in these technology companies um a lot of them happen to be marvel fans so that's a that's a bonus for us but um they go see the films and they connect the dots as far as the types of technologies that we're uh, designing in these movies can somehow be real within the next, you know, three to five years. And they might be working on something that's actually within the realm of what we designed for the films. And then they call us and say, hey, look, we're kind of working on something like that. It's not going to come out in two years. It's going to come out in five. But we'd love to collaborate with you guys and your team to design this product that we're presenting to the public in, you know, in the year 2026. Um, but we want it to look cool because, uh, you know, the, the, the program or the back end that's running it is, is very strong, but the look of it and a lot of these companies, because they're very, uh, heavy on the engineering side, um, don't necessarily worry about the design. And a lot of the times that's what hurts, uh, these technologies, you know, they can be great, but if people don't want to use them or if you don't create a, a great user experience, um, at the same time nobody's really going to want to, you know, uh, use them. So um, they reach out to us. We try to make it look as cool as possible as if Tony Stark was designing it or someone, uh, you know, someone of that, uh, of that mind. And, um, and that's how we end up working with those uh, projects. So I have a kind of like a follow up question on that. So we had a professor uh, at UCLA and uh, she did like this talk about how companies uh, not steal, I get, get inspired by each other's activities. And they're, uh, one of the examples that they were saying is um, there was like this uh, company who created um, concrete, like they had cement and they had to deliver it to like uh, construction sites and uh, they wanted to innovate. And this is like the least innovative thing that there is. But they had this problem where they need to figure out how to deliver this stuff faster. And uh, in order, uh, they looked at their competition. Nobody was doing that. Everybody was struggling with this. And uh, they started to look at other industries. And um, eventually, they figured out that the the companies that are doing very well with quick deliveries are pizza companies who are basically delivering pizza. And they figured out how they work and they went to those uh, 
you know, like Domino's and all the others and try to understand how their logistics work and so on. They integrated some of those techniques in their own business and became hugely successful. One of the most innovative company of like year, I don't remember what, but I'm telling this story with, with a question in mind. So when you're building these interfaces, when you're thinking about this future that you're creating, both for like technological companies and just for movies, uh, where do you look for inspiration? Does this come from the interfaces that already exist? Does this come from just sketches that the artists are making? Are you looking for the future in the reality around us? Or is this something that just pops to your mind and you're putting this on paper? The films, I mean, it's, it's, it all comes back to, uh, the, the story and the characters in these films. Um, the technology that we're creating for these characters have to, uh, they have to support uh, whatever that scene is about. They have to really showcase this character's technology and innovation, and in some cases, their personality. When we're designing uh, Tony Stark's technology, it's very different than when we're designing Nick Fury's technology, or Jane Foster's technology, or Spider-Man's technology. Everybody's tech has to be some sort of reflection of who they are, um, their their own level of innovation and their own resources, right? Obviously, Tony Stark has unlimited resources and, and funds and he can create, you know, what, whatever uh, money can buy. Um, whereas someone like uh, uh, Jane Foster, who we designed the tech for in Thor 2, you know, her her tech was, was, was very innovative, but it was more um, scrappy, you know, pieces of uh, Radio Shack parts and uh, duct tape uh, put together to create her, uh, her devices. Um, when we're designing for S.H.I.E.L.D., it's more about, you know, the utilitarian aspect of it. It feels more like military and mission critical and, you know, it's not as flourishy and artistic and impressionistic as, you know, Tony Stark's. And then with Wakanda, which was, which we got to do, uh, you know, in 2018, we were tasked with coming up with something that went beyond Tony Stark and was a whole other level, something that we hadn't seen before. Um, but the, you know, part of that assignment was how can we pull from the culture of Wakanda? And fortunately, Marvel had a, uh, had a Bible that they were working on, a production Bible for Wakanda. It was like 500 plus pages that outlined all of um, the clothing and the transportation and the, the traditions of Wakanda, the different, um, uh, architecture of Wakanda, uh, colors, patterns, textiles, all of these materials um, that they had already sort of thought through um, and were part of that world that they were building, we were able to use as inspiration for the technology of Wakanda that we were asked to uh, brainstorm on. Um, so that's a huge part of the inspiration is taking all the, the raw materials that the filmmakers and the writers and the production designers have already thought through for these films and these characters and using that as our launching pad into the, into the technology. And then of course, it's what does this scene have to convey? What are they using this phone for? What are they using this uh, interactive mirror for? What are they, I don't know, using this, uh, this hologram for? And if, if we can, if we can capture that, then we've, we've achieved that goal. But if we, if we miss that, then that's, that's a huge miss. And that's the most important part. Uh, it's our most important responsibility is making sure that we're carrying that story point forward, that the audience is following along. We're not distracting them with the tech. You know, we don't want to be so in your face and take people out of the scene that they forgot, you know, what the whole point of the technology was to begin with. But we also want to make sure that all the tech that we create is grounded in some sort of reality and believability, and it has some authenticity to it. Um, it's not so far into the future that people won't believe it's possible. It's just far enough that it has some connection with reality and maybe some cutting edge tech that's being developed in a lab or in a, in a university somewhere that we can pull from. And we do a lot of that type of research as well, just kind of scouring the world and seeing what's, you know, what's in the labs, what's in the uh, universities right now that we can maybe use. Um, so all of those things are, are the places that we draw inspiration from. Yeah, we actually create... Um technology audits for the feature films depending on what time what what time we we are introduced or what time we brought in for those projects 
and they love to hear all the different technologies that we're working with, you know, with our technology clients and things like that. Not that we we share that information because we're not allowed to, but there's definitely some um, uh, confidence. And of course, they understand that we have the experience in that world and they definitely don't want their the world of Black Panther or any other um, films to be magical because it's too unbelievable if it's like magic. You know, they definitely, like Jeremy said, it needs to be grounded in some sort of uh, uh, logic. Um, so, yeah, and I think um, having, as far as inspiration, I think having the the team that we have, you know, they're, they're great design, um, they're great designers, but they also have like a, like a technology itch or some sort of, um, uh, they, they just love tech. So that's just a bonus when it comes to us having to research for a film or for um, the technology projects that we have. But you mentioned, it's funny that you mentioned the cement um, project because we had a similar project that we had to uh, find a solution for, which was uh, a paving company. And it was this, uh, you know, the asphalt that they put in the back of the trucks, it's heated to a certain temperature. And, you know, when they're driving along in this um, convoy of, you know, five to 10 trucks, some trucks slow down, they get hit with traffic, and then it throws the temperature off. So if you don't pour the or, or put down the asphalt at a certain temperature, it doesn't, it doesn't stay, you know, it doesn't uh, stay strong or, or, you know, stay the test of time, and it starts to break up. So that was a challenge that we had to come up with, you know, and there's so many different variables like weather, traffic, the driver themselves. Um, so we came up with a whole kind of um, application that one person can look at from a master, you know, control center and they could see like, uh oh, you know, truck number five has a flat. We got to go, you know, send another truck and get that one back here or whatever it is. Um, so there was a, it was an interesting um, challenge. And that's what they all come down to is all um design challenges and you know it's not about doing pretty pictures it's about creating something that's beautiful elegant but that works because if it doesn't work what's the point if it looks beautiful nobody's going to want to look at it anyway so i have a i have a question like connected with that and uh, thank you so much for giving this answer i think that uh, partially you kind of answered my previous question whether and it was um like does it just have to look cool or does it have to do something like is sh should be there be some function and my favorite <clears throat> story about that i think i stole it from mike hill who's like a designer in movies and games and uh, he gave an example the movie event horizon like in in event horizon is like a sci-fi picture it's about this ship that goes into like a black hole and everybody goes crazy but um, the example that he underlined there is that in their cockpit, like where uh, like the crew was sitting, they had this chair for the captain, which was um, it was moving with very slowly with some kind of like ele electric motor or something. And every time the person would have to move to see the captain, they would press a button and then it would for like like a minute of the film or 30 seconds or something painfully slowly would turn and then the kind of the conversation would continue and so on and his example was that the chair that was in the movie totally functionally didn't fit because the actor who later went from this chair he just took because he was so frustrated because he was motorizing this uh, weird uh, furniture he basically took his hand and just swirled it around it was swirling like crazy like on the where, where it was installed and uh, my question is like especially when you're doing with film because i think in uh, in tech it's kind of more utilitarian you still have to there is some business purpose behind it like but in film how do you make sure that you don't go overboard like when you know that it's not just christmas lights on a panel but those buttons actually mean something they do something how do you uh, kind of avoid making them kind of useless? You know what I mean? Yeah, I think that comes with just uh, the collaboration with us and the film companies, especially with Marvel. They know, um, and 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 I assume and I hope it's why they come to us that that it goes back to the storytelling aspect. You know, we create these elements 
with that character in mind, whether that person's, you know, um, the, the hero or the villain. Um, there's always something that's, that's attached to it. You know, there's, there's always like a, you know, a background monitor that has something that's just up there. It doesn't really make sense because it's blurred out and things like that, that we've done stuff for. But whenever something's in focus and whenever something's part of that story, um, you know, we actually ask, like, can we get part, you know, pieces of the script if we don't get to see the movie? Can we get that scene? You know, things like that to kind of give us more information so we can design with, with the intent of, you know, helping tell that story. Yeah, I would just say that um, Marvel is great when it comes to putting our tech designs and screen designs under the microscope and making sure that everything that we put on those screens and those devices makes sense has a reason to be there, has a logic, isn't just background noise or ones and zeros that are put in there for texture. Everything is there. You know, sometimes we're, we add Easter eggs, right? Because Marvel audiences and fans love to find little hidden gems that uh, were put there on purpose. Um, maybe they, uh, they're, they're really well hidden. Um, but, you know, we, we, uh, we think that stuff through and, uh, you know, try to, try to plant that where we can. Um, but yeah, like Danny said, it comes down to the storytelling and making sure that everything that we put in there is there to help move that scene forward or support the dialogue or support whatever, um, uh, you, function that the character is using that piece of text for, um, whatever the sequence is, uh, the download sequence or the upload or the, the hacking sequence or whatever it happens to be that everything on that screen is, is there for that little piece of storytelling. So... Well, let me ask you like a, a question connected with your previous answer. So you, you mentioned that uh, people who work with you, they love tech. And um, I have like a broader question. So you've created this business basically uh, on your own, like and you worked in a bigger company and then you built this uh, through a number of years. And uh, my question is like, what does it take to kind of work for you guys? Like, how do you find the talent how do you hire like what are the main things that make you think that this person might fit or maybe things that uh, immediately say that this is like some kind of like a deal breaker and this person is not going to be able to work with us right i think first and foremost it has to be the right fit uh, personality wise you have to have a very um very huge passion for the work um, and you have to be willing to learn as well, because no one comes into percept. We don't hire people that have the skill set already. They kind of come to perception because they're a great designer or, or they do something specific. You know, we try to find people with different skill sets. Um, but the main ingredient for us is that whoever joins the core, the, the, the perception team has to be a thinker and has to be able to use their mind to guide these, these designs. Because number one, if you can't explain what you're designing to someone who's, you know, to a client for a movie or for tech, whatever it is, I don't, you know, there's no point. So I think that the, 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 the idea of having the, you know, the, 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 the mentality and having the, the, the thinking um, is key. And then again, the passion, because there's days that you're going to be, you know, when, when it comes to like the last two weeks when you're working on a film, you might not go home. You might be showering at the studio. And that's something that a lot of people do not want to do. I mean, there's been times Jeremy and I worked on, you know, we did Iron Man 2. It was probably three, four weeks I didn't come home. And, I, and we didn't even have a shower at the studio. So you didn't even want to know what, <laughs> what I smelled like, uh, you know, after a week or two. But, um, but we figured it out. You know, um, we never want to, you know, burn the team out. But, but there's a certain passion that you have to have. You know, that's kind of the rules of engagement for these sort of projects. Um, and I think people are like, you know, it's great. I want to work on films and they come in there and they do it. And they're just like, this is not what I thought it was going to be. And we're very, you know, we're very uh, black and white when, when, I, when we're trying to find the right team, we tell them like, it's, you know, this sometimes this could be punishing. Um, but, but again, it goes back to, uh, trying to find people that don't have the skill set of the current team <clears throat> definitely are, are great thinkers. Um, and just love uh, finding solutions to some pretty um, hard design problems, especially in the tech. You know, there's uh, these companies are coming to us, you know, we're working with people that have like, you know, 
PhDs and all these um, uh, real, real um, smart people. And it's just, uh, they're coming to us to find solutions that they can't figure out. And I don't have a PhD, but <clears throat> they come to us to, to seek the expertise to try and figure out how we're going to solve for this. How can we make this a moment of delight for, for the, the people using it or for the you know, people in the theater? You know, how can we make this special? Yeah, I, I think uh, the the key is uh, just having people that that are bringing something unique and 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 special uh, to the team that we don't currently have. Um, it goes beyond uh, you know just being able to design and animate. Um, it goes into um, something that's very unique or very special and almost um, uh, an intangible quality um, that we're you know always excited by. Um, you know, obviously we want people who are, are talented designers and creatives, but it's that a little, little extra something um, that really helps them uh, uh, find, a, find a seat at perception. Um, you know, what Danny's referring to is our work ethic. We have a crazy work ethic that I think was uh, uh, branded into us at RGA. You know, RGA was definitely an intense place, and that's where we both got our, uh, our, our, our butts kicked. Uh, coming up as as youngins, um, but that was the culture that we came up in. That's what we saw uh, that led to their you know tremendous success. Um, it was a it was a place that wasn't for everybody, and if it wasn't right for a particular person, they they left or they were asked to leave. But it sort of like focused it into you know, and I hate to say it like this, but an almost elite group um, that was there. Uh, at the time and you know everybody felt like they were special or they were chosen or selected to be there and it created this uh, amazing culture where you know everybody really tried to uh, do their best in order to keep up with their peers because everybody around you was so good and so talented that you know that that kind of competitive spirit a healthy competitive spirit was a big part of uh, my years at RGA and I think that has definitely um carried forward into perception. You know, it's something that Danny and I have like in our DNA now, it's in our blood. Um, so I don't even think we think about it anymore, but it, it's definitely there. Um, you know, and perception uh, team members uh, have that too. And we're very proud of the fact that our team uh, sticks around for a long time. You know, there's a lot of companies in our industry where it's more of a revolving door People come and go. They they're there for a few months or maybe a year, but that's about it. You know, we've had people at Perception there for over a decade, uh, which you know we're both very very proud of. I think it's a testament to to the company, the work, the team. Uh, you know, the opportunities that we get. It's uh, it's amazing. It's amazing. You know, we're both very blessed to to have to be have been able to work with such talented people and for such amazing clients and and such amazing amazing jobs. Um, and uh, I think that's a, a big part of it is, is just having the right team there for the ride. You guys gave some very interesting answers, and uh, what I heard a lot was like discipline, the right mindset, maybe soft skills, a little bit of a competition kind of in your heart that you want to do like your best job. Um, but like in our audience, we have a lot of people who are younger and who are either graduating or they're doing their first project. And one of the questions I hear a lot is um, like, what tools do I need to know? Like, uh, do I need to know like Meyer, Blender or ZBrush or blah, 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 or something, something, something. And um, what's your kind of take on that? Like, is there some kind of like a magical combination of different <laughs> software that you need to know? or? Is it enough to have like, you know, a pen and paper and to make sure that you can draw something and explain something like what's your attitude toward that? Well, I think first off, it depends on what the role is that you're you're looking to do. I mean, obviously, if you're uh, more in the project management or producer side of perception, you don't really need to know any um, animation software, 3D software. You need to understand it. You need to understand the process and the flow. But you're you're leading a project from a from production end. 
Um, if you're an artist and you're looking to get into uh, the actual animation and the uh, the building of these sequences, then yeah, for sure. Uh, Cinema 4D, After Effects, the entire Adobe suite, actually. Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, Premiere. We use all of them for different reasons. Um, Cinema 4D is our bread and butter for 3D. We use some Houdini. We use a little bit of Unreal now. We're getting more involved in that um, for compositing. Programs like Nuke is indispensable to us. Um, so it really all depends on the role. You know, if you're just an editor, then you're going to be a master premiere. If you're a 3D uh, animator, then you're going to be the master at Cinema 4D and all the various modules that, that you can get into in, in that world. So, uh, And um, kind of like the last question that I have, uh, one of the challenges right now that uh, everybody has, especially like in business, is that there is uh, too much information. Like there is too much data, then there is too much information. And um, to kind of trying to harness some kind of like business intelligence out of all of that becomes more and more challenging every day. And uh, one of the one of the tasks that our AD level team has, like apart from the AD level and the is trying to figure out to figure that out. And um, we're constantly trying to figure out how to visualize that information, like how to show, you know, what it means, like all those zeros and ones and so on. And my question for you guys is, since you're kind of building the future, you're trying to create these interfaces, both for story, but also for like real businesses. What do you think is going to happen in the next like five years? Like, how are we going to look at this information, all this data? Are we going to rely on some, you know, I don't know, like VR, XR, AR things? Are we going to rely more on smartphones or still kind of be connected with these uh, flat screens that we're, we have at home? Are we going to have like five monitors to figure this out? Like, what's your take on that? Like, where, what does the future hold in this direction? Uh, I think there's going to be a huge um, <clears throat> AR influence. I mean, for me personally, but I always like to say, you know, we're, the, we're kind of designing ourselves out of a job because the ultimate interface is the one you don't see and you don't need to use. You know, it just knows automatically, like I, you know, I get in my car, it knows it's me, it's driving me to work, it's take, it's doing everything for me, you know. Um, so it's hard to say, you know, what might be being used uh, five years from now, because I feel like I can give you five numbers for the lottery and I'll be closer with that than I would be with technologies that are going to be out there. Because from the, from when I was at RGA in 95 until now, and just seeing what I went through with computers and things like that, and then seeing like I have a, a 20 year old daughter and 17 year old son, you know, they automatically grew up with the iPads and all that. Like there's a, a huge, like explosion of technology. So, you know, within the next five years, is it going to be multiplied? Is it going to be slowed? I don't know. I feel like it's just going to, I mean, obviously it's going to advance. I just don't know how fast it's going to go. So I think there's definitely going to be some AR, um, you know, I, I picture, you know, someone like myself, obviously getting older, you know, and I wear glasses, maybe there's something in the newer glasses that's telling me, you know, things, you know, obviously there's the watches that tell you, you know, your, your health. And if you're hiking and, you know, it shows you the map of the trail you're on. Whereas when I went hiking with my father, we would have a piece of paper on a map and we'd probably get lost because my dad was holding it upside down, you know? So, um, it's re I mean, I, I you know, I, I just think there's going to be de definitely a, a heavy influence in, in the AR and, and VR. Obviously, there's the, the metaverse. Um, who knows where all these, uh, the, the, the whole monetary, um, um, I guess, you know, uh, the, the business in, in, in that regard with NFTs and Bitcoin and things like that. Like, there's just so many things that are right now opening that I'm not sure which way certain things are going to go and what, you know, uh, what's going to be in the future. All right. 
Guys, well, uh, I want to thank you for your time. I know you're super busy and you just had a huge project that you, because we rescheduled this a couple of times. Uh, thank you so much. I hope you find more clients and do more amazing things and you're, um, at your studio. And uh, we'll leave the links so if everybody, anybody wants to learn more or maybe send you an application, um, they can do that through the email there. All right. Thank you so much. And, Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for enjoying another episode of the 80 Level Roundtable podcast. Check out upcoming episodes on the 80 Level website at 80.lv. Join our career site at 80.lv slash RFP. And share our podcast with friends and on your social networks.